Welcome to the Pomerantz Mentor Series. Today's vignette is going to continue the summation of MR of the hip with some anatomic variations. So let's get right to the heart of the matter. We'll begin with a coronal but somewhat intermediate yet water weighted sequence due to the presence of fat suppression giving us an arthrographic effect and showing us the superior and the inferior labrum. It's a little bit of fraying of the ligamentum teres and this laminar effect of dark signal intensity in the superolateral acetabulum is diagnostic of chondromalacia. In fact, this has a 90% specificity for the phenomenon known as cartilage delamination or cartilage peeling. And once again, the ligamentum teres insertion and its fraying are highlighted, remembering that there are two bundles of insertion, a pubic and an ischial bundle. In the axial projection, we see a labral tear, remembering that at the 8 o'clock position anteriorly, there is often a small, thin, but non-full thickness cleft. This transverse three-dimensional water excitation true fast imaging sequence with steady state preprocession in a 35-year-old woman shows a cyst that has arisen from a full thickness tear in the anterior labrum in much the same way you'd have a paralabral meniscal cyst around the knee or a paralabral meniscal cyst around the shoulder in a slap lesion, so too can you get dissecting cysts, in this case dissecting anteromedially from this through and through labral tear. Just a word about the thickness of hyaline cartilage, which we see as a slight hyperintense smooth structure, a little thicker medial and a little thinner laterally. The thickness of the femoral head cartilage increases from periphery to center as depicted with the white arrowheads on the femoral side. The maximal thickness is actually found in the region of the ligamentum teres. But conversely, the acetabular cartilage, which is depicted with the black arrowheads, it's the other half of this whitish stripe that we see beneath the black portion of the acetabular cortex, increases in thickness from medial to lateral. There is no cartilage whatsoever in the acetabular fossa. This area is filled with fat and is often referred to as the pulvinar, as depicted on this oblique coronal 3D water excitation image performed with seven and a half kilograms of traction on the leg. Let's talk a little bit about arthrographic technique and assessment of hip hyaline cartilage. For any joint, avoid dilutions that are more concentrated than 1 to 200 gadolinium to saline. You can use anesthetic and iodinated contrast to help you see where you are. But if you're doing a pure CT arthrogram, in other words, you're not using gadolinium, avoid very, very dense concentrations of iodine which can obscure key pieces of anatomy. So anything at or less than 25% or 350 milligrams per ml will do. The maximal thickness of femoral cartilage is 1.5 to 3.8 millimeters on CT and 1.9 to 4.7 millimeters on coronal MRI. The femoral cartilage is thicker as you move towards the center of the femoral head. The mean thickness of acetabular cartilage is 1.88 on MR, but it does get thicker as you move off to the lateral side of the joint. Most importantly though, when you're eyeballing a coronal MRI, the mean thickness of the combined acetabular and femoral cartilage is 3.12 millimeters on MRI, or about 3 millimeters. There are unique techniques available for hyaline cartilage assessment, and some of them are pretty new. One of them is known as D. Gemrick, delayed gadolinium enhancement on MR imaging of cartilage. This is a technique in which the T1 weighted image is obtained after injection of negatively charged gadolinium or it can be placed intra-articularly. 
A low flip angle, T1 appearing image, allows speedy acquisition after contrast. In an asymptomatic individual, especially somebody with CAM type impingement, it is not uncommon to see contrast get into the altered chemistry of diseased hyaline cartilage. And what happens in that chemical event is that the negatively charged gadolinium is now attracted to the degenerated, positively charged cartilage. So it starts to fill the cartilage space. This occurs very early on. So it can occur in asymptomatic as well as symptomatic patients with arthrosis and with early CAM-type impingement. It is especially easy to detect these very early intrasubstance chemical changes on thin section radial reconstructions performed with 3D imaging. Other techniques that are available in all the joints, and this is true for DGEMRIC as well, include T2 or T2 star or T2 susceptibility mapping. In this technique, you measure the T2 relaxivity of the tissue by fixing the TR at about 800 to 1,000 and then varying the TE. There will be some spatial variation in the overall visual signal due to magic angle effect or the anisotropic artifact, which is seen when cartilage lies at 54.7 degrees to the main magnetic bore. But experts learn how to ignore this. The change in T2 relaxivity reflects an alteration in the water and collagen arrangement. You can then assign pixel by pixel a color based on the T2 relaxivity. And the change in color will reflect an alteration in chemistry. As a rule of thumb, the deeper layers of cartilage have shorter T2 relaxivity than the more superficial and middle layers. This is known as the phenomenon of stratification. Another technique is known as T1 row. It uses spin lock pulses with low power and an RF pulse on resonance with the Larmor frequency with very short TEs, in fact ultra short TEs, to detect differences in interactions between water and extracellular matrix molecules. The magnetic vector is locked in a rotating frame. Said another way, very subtle differences in T1 relaxivity using this special pulse sequence will reflect as well an alteration in chemistry within the cartilage. Let's take a look at a high resolution, sagittal, double echo, steady state free procession water emphasized image in which the cartilage is visible in the back with the acetabular cartilage white a thin gray slit representing the capsule, and then another white area representing the femoral hyaline cartilage. As we move forward, this arrangement becomes a little more ill-defined and in indistinct. As we move forward again, certain portions of the hyaline cartilage start to show a slightly lower signal intensity than their more posterior healthy counterparts. This is also true very subtly in the front where the relaxivity is slightly diminished under the acetabulum compared to the relaxivity of cartilage in the back. These are subtle chemical changes. It's amazing. We can actually map these and see that the relaxivity in the front by virtue of its lower color profile is shorter in this 35 year old man than it is in the back using the technique known as degemric or contrast enhanced MRI. We could also see the same phenomenon with a T2 relaxivity map. Here is a sagittal demonstrating different zones compared to one another. The, left, the less healthy zone in the front has a lower color arrangement. The more healthy area in the back has a higher color arrangement. And the T1 relaxivity between these two areas is about 86 milliseconds. 86 milliseconds higher in the healthier area and lower and darker in the less 
healthy area reflecting an alteration in proteoglycans and glycosaminoglycans. Let's look at the coronal oblique views of the hip showing you some hip plica. Plica are seen in multiple locations. Five or six have been described, but we'll show you three common ones. There's an inferior plica. There is a paralabral plica. There is the inferior plica de demonstrated sagittally on a contrast enhanced MRR. Don't confuse the inferior plica with the inferior capsule and the somewhat lax transverse acetabular ligament. There's another inferior plica. And here's one that is paralleling the region of the ligamentum teres, a third type of plica. There's the ligamentum teres. There is the adjacent plica on this contrast enhanced MR. And on the very same image is a paralabral plica. There's another anterior paralabral plica. There's the labrum. There is the plica. There's our inferior plica. There is our inferior transverse ligament. So you've seen at least three plica here. Inferior plica, ligamentum teres plica, and paralabral plica. You'll see that some of these plical reflections have been given unique names in the last few years. There are several relevant hip ligaments. You've already heard about the inferior transverse acetabular ligament, which completes the ring of the femur, which is formed by the labrum but the labrum doesn't go all the way around. The inferior portion of the hip is closed by the transverse ligament. There is the very strong anterior iliofemoral ligament, or Y ligament, or Bigelow ligament. It's shaped like an inverted Y, and it reinforces the anterior capsule. It's one of the strongest ligaments in the entire body. There's an inferior band known as the medial arm. There's a superior band, also known as the lateral arm, or iliotrochanteric ligament. There's also a PFL, a pubofemoral ligament, which makes up the anterior inferior hip joint support. In the back, there is an ischiofemoral ligament. It straightens the posterior portion of the hip and capsule. It's divided into a superior band and an inferior band. And you've heard previously about the circular or obliquely oriented or circumferential band known as the zona abicularis, more consistently seen posteriorly than anteriorly, and defining above it the intraarticular space and below it the extraarticular space. Then there is the ligamentum teres itself, which carries with it a small vessel accounting for 10% of the blood supply of the femoral head. This ligament divides into two heads. There is both a pubic head and an ischial head. Here's an example of ligamentum teres degeneration seen in the axial projection. It's present in the coronal projection, but because of volume averaging effects, it doesn't show up as well. But on the left side, look at all of this bright signal, wispy irregularity, and the frayed appearance of the ligamentum teres as it approaches the fovea capitis. Let's talk a little bit more about folds and plica, and sometimes these two are referred to with different terminologies in different countries. So there are situations where a synovial fold and a plica may be referring to the same thing. The retinacula of Weibrecht, course medial to the nutrient foramen of the femoral neck, encompassing branches of the medial circumflex femoral artery. The pectinofovial fold is more prominent around the femoral neck it arises from the medial femoral neck 75% of the time and inserts on the capsule and the femur in the rest. Here is, on a contrast enhanced T1 coronal MR, oblique coronal, the more lateral and inferior retinacula of Weibrecht to be distinguished by or from the paralabral plica. There's the strong lateral iliofemoral ligament. There is the ligamentum teres. Here's the pectinofoveal fold, which is sometimes called
called the inferior plica. The pectinofoveal fold lies in close proximity to the inferior transverse acetabular ligament. The transverse acetabular ligament is continuous with the inferior labrum and the inferior aspect of the ligament of teres, which has a ligament to ligamentous origin. An interesting structure is the iliocapsularis muscle. It's known as the iliacus minor or iliotrochantericus muscle. It originates from the capsule and the anterior inferior iliac spine and extends to insert on the lesser trochanter. It's a stabilizer of the femoral head in hip dysplasia. Excessive acetabular coverage may be associated with fatty infiltration of the iliocapsularis muscle in femoral acetabular impingement type 2. This axial T1 weighted image demonstrates the iliopsoas muscle, the rectus femoris muscle and tendon, and between the two, the triangular shaped iliocapsularis muscle. The skeletal structures in and around the hip are well known. They're highlighted, especially key areas of attachment. We've got the femoral head in blue, the greater trochanter in red, and the lesser trochanter also in red. The iliac crest is a common site of apophysitis. It is an apophysis, and it may be a site of injury to the abdominal wall musculature origin. The anterosuperior iliac spine is the site of origin for the sartorius muscle and for the tensor fascia lata. The anterior inferior iliac spine, which is not labeled with a red spot, is the site of origin for one of the heads of the rectus femoris muscle or tendon. The other head takes off from the acetabular roof, the greater trochanter. It's a very busy place where the gluteus medius and minimus and other external rotators will insert. And then the ischial apophysis. This is a place where the hamstrings and one of the major adductors, the adductor magnus, takes off. This is also a site of attachment for the ischiotuberous ligament, not so labeled. Also not labeled on our wall of information here on the left is the lesser tuberosity or trochanter, a site of attachment for the iliopsoas tendon. Let's turn our attention now to the greater trochanter and to the abductor tendons and bursa, especially the gluteus medius, which is an underappreciated cause of symptoms. It has an attachment to the supero-posterior facet and to the lateral facet of the greater trochanter. Near the top of the trochanter is a bald spot, 21 millimeters in diameter, covered by the gluteus medius bursa and bordered by the gluteus medius, the gluteus minimus, and the piriformis. One-third of all contrast-enhanced MRs have enhancement between the gluteus medius and the iliotibial band in the normal patient. Here's a view of some of the attachments on the greater trochanter. The anterior facet in yellow, seen in the frontal and lateral projection. The posterior facet, seen in the lateral projection posteriorly and in the back on a posterior view of the hip. The lateral facet, seen best in the lateral view and a little bit in the posterior view, and the supero-posterior facet, seen best in the posterior view. Here again are some of the facets highlighted, but in relationship to the structures that insert on them. The gluteus minimus, it inserts on the anterior and lateral facets. The anterior and lateral facet. The gluteus medius inserts on the lateral, but also the supero-posterior facet. The gluteus medius, followed by the minimus, are very common causes of tendon symptomatology with low-grade bursitis. Let's look at the three main bursa of the hip as they are drawn into their respective locations. The gluteus minimus bursa in the front, the main portion of the 
subgluteus medius bursa, in other words, it's under the gluteus medius tendon, is in the lateral facet. But there is also a component postero superiorly not drawn. The biggest of the bursa, but the one that is least commonly symptomatic, is the subgluteus maximus bursa, also known as the trochanteric bursa, seen all the way in the back and slightly more inferior than its postero superior medius counterpart. Another word about the abductor tendons. There is a high incidence of minimus and medius tendon injuries, especially in patients with systemic disease. Renal disease and renal transplant disease is a simple example of this. Normally, there is some bursal hyperintensity next to the femur and to the greater trochanter in the normal individual. How do you tell when it's abnormal? When the patient has symptoms and tenderness in that area and there's asymmetry. You can also look at plain films. If there is radiographic surface irregularities of greater than two millimeters, this has a high association of gluteus injuries, especially gluteus medius tendon injuries or tears, which you can actually inspect by MRI, the medius and minimus tendons directly to see if they're smooth and straight and non-inflamed interstitially. Let's look at the normal anatomy. There's the gluteus medius tendon coming down on the lateral facet and reflecting off the postero superior facet. There's the gluteus minimus tendon, which will continue on anteriorly. And we have the piriformis tendon, the obturator externus, the quadratus femoris, all inserting on the greater tuberosity. In the sagittal view, the gluteus medius tendon seen in the postero superior aspect of the greater trochanter, the piriformis, the obturator internus, the obturator externus, on their way to insert on the anterior inferior aspect of the greater trochanter of the hip. Here is a normal gluteus medius tendon. There is a small, collapsed, not well seen bursa that will be visible as a very slight, subtle blush on a water-weighted sequence. And that's normal, as long as the tendon is normal and there's relative symmetry to the opposite side and there's no bony irregularities. This arrow points to the bald spot, whereas the piriformis delimits the medial aspect of the bald spot and the gluteus medius, the lateral aspect of the bald spot. This is a coronal T1 weighted image in a healthy 19 year old woman. The bald spot is highlighted by our long white arrow. Let's look at the greater trochanter and the fascia lata. It is not uncommon to see a little bit of signal underneath and in the gluteus medius, but just barely visible due to a combination of volume averaging and magic angle effect. But the bursa that sits between the medius and the fascia lata is thin and delicate and symmetric and will be visible as a slightly increased area of higher signal intensity between it and the fascia lata. On this coronal fat saturated arthrographic MR image, one sees the capsular space, a Wybrex synovial fold, and a circumferential or circular ligament which forms the lateral boundary of the zona abicularis. The medial boundary is covered up by text, and this interface delimits the difference between the intraarticular space to my right, the extraarticular space to my left. This finding, this thin, symmetric, smooth finding, should not be misconstrued as a bursitis. If you're confused by all these issues, normal variants, the sets, bursa, insertions that exist around the hip. You're not alone. I have a little mnemonic to help you remember some of the insertions around the greater trochanter of the femur. It goes PO2G3 or POG. P for piriformis, medial side upper greater trochanter. O for obturator externus, trochanteric fossa, antero superior. 
obturator internus, medial greater trochanter, antero superior within the trochanteric fossa, like its externus counterpart. Then the gamellae, the medial greater trochanter. And, and we have two gamellae. We have a superior gamellus and an inferior gamellus. Then the gluteus minimus on the anterolateral greater trochanter and the gluteus medius on the lateral and the posterior superior greater trochanter. All part of the G3 group. The obturator is part of the O2 group and the piriformis part of the P group. Pog or pog. Let's look at an abnormal gluteus medius. There was irregularity on the plane film, but also on the MR of the greater trochanter. The gluteus medius has an irregular, attenuated, attritional distal change. One starts to see fatty infiltration in the abducting tissues of the hip on this coronal T2-weighted MRI. Here's the plane film demonstrating radiographic evidence of this irregularity and some irregular ossification that corresponds to abductor injury and abnormality in a 73-year-old woman with peritrochanteric pain. Two millimeters of irregularity, whether they be excrescences or depressions, are highly predictive of gluteus medius tendon abnormality. In a patient with osseous irregularities, it's not uncommon to see lateral and posterolateral bursitis as a blush of hyperintensity, markedly asymmetric from the contralateral side on a water-weighted image, this being an inversion recovery water-emphasized MRI involving the gluteus medius and the gluteus maximus or trochanteric posterior bursa. There's another one with severe attritional change redundancy and tear of the gluteus medius tendon with diffuse fatty replacement of the gluteus medius muscle producing severe pain and inability to abduct the hip. So this summarizes our review of anatomy of the hip where we focused on the ligaments, the folds, the synechii, the plica, the bursa, the abductors, the positions of various origins of key muscles around the hip and the pelvis. We finished with a subtle demonstration of abductor muscular abnormalities that are much more common than we previously thought, but in fact are a common cause of hip pain in middle-aged and elderly women and some men. Thank you.